Good day, Brutal Planet listeners. This is Eric Peterson, quarantining from Salt Lake City. And today I have the honor to be joined by Mark Jansen of Epica. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm fine, thank you. And uh, how are you? I'm good. Where are you joining us from? Uh, I live in Sicily, South Italy. How are things there? Uh, it's a bit uh, locked down, no lockdown. And uh, some things are possible, some things are not possible. Some things uh, locally locked down, so it's every every day it changes. And uh, but uh, we are we're hanging in there and uh, making the best out of it. Are you getting out to do some biking at all? Oh yeah, that that's possible. Fortunately, the because during the first lockdown uh, in uh, last year, they even forbid uh, sport activities outside. Oh wow! But uh, luckily now it's uh, allowed, so I I go to ride my bike a lot. Yes. Good, good. Well, that sounds a lot better than here. I mean, we've got the pandemic along with all the political issues, so it could be worse. You could be yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've seen all about it on uh, on TV. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? It's, it's it looks really weird. Yeah, it's, if if you would have t- told me this about like twenty years ago, I, I said uh, this is not going to happen. Exactly. But over the over the years, it gradually got more weird, and then now <laughs> this kind of explosion of weirdness <laughs> yes exactly it's weirdness is the best word you could use for it yeah but so, yeah hopefully uh not the whole year to 2021 is going to be like this yeah hopefully it's not the sequel to, to 2020 no 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 <laughs> so you guys are really uh, yeah who knows, who knows? You guys- we'll see what what uh, but uh, i'm uh, positive and uh, after every chaotic uh, period of time comes always uh, good good times as well. So I guess we just need to be patient. Yeah, I think you're right. It's I mean we're kind of I'm kind of looking at it like after this is all over, we're going to be back into the roaring twenties and you know a hundred years ago where everybody was booming and, and having fun in their suits yeah. and everything. So <laughs> I hope for that too. Yeah. So you guys are releasing uh, Omega on uh, February 26th, right? Yes, that's right. Tell me a little bit about the album. How has the current situation affected? How did it affect the recording and the whole process for you guys? Uh, yeah, it, it got uh, a bit delayed, uh, but that, uh, the main reason for that was that we initially had uh, some touring uh, planned for the end of uh, 2020. And as that didn't happen, uh, we moved it uh, to February, uh, the release date of uh, to February of this year. Uh-huh. And uh, despite uh, that, uh, the, t- the touring still is not going to happen. We we keep on uh, going with the schedule because we don't want to delay it any further. Yeah. And I think also that uh, it's it's important at a certain point to just go for it and release it. Uh, the fans have been waited long enough, and uh, they're eager to hear the music. And uh, so I'm happy that now it's a fixed uh, release date, uh, February 26th. And uh, recording-wise, we actually didn't have much of uh, diff- we didn't experience much difficulties because uh, it was pretty much recorded in the studio when the pandemic hit us, and it was just Simona and me who had re- to record still some vocals, and I did it uh, in my home studio. And she recorded hers in uh, in a studio close to her hometown uh, uh, in Stuttgart. Oh, okay. And it remind me, you guys had a uh, you, you. I thought I heard an interview from you uh, last year that said your rec- rec- recording studio is a uh, walk-in closet in your in your in your place. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do have a home studio, but not the, the vocal booth is not ready yet. It's still oh, okay. not ready yet. Okay. So uh, the the walk-in closet uh, functions as the as the vocal booth still up till today for all the recordings. <laughs> so, so that was used a little for this. Was was the was Wait, the, I have a little connection uh, issue? Oh, sorry. Was the uh, the was the closet I, closet used for this? Uh, yes, the, the, I, I used the closet for all the recordings also of the, the Omega album, yes. Nice. So I just received my review copy this morning, and I was skimming through the tracks, and I, I think Ep- Epica fans are going to love this. I mean, I love what I heard already. <laughs> Some of the tracks I wanted cool. to ch- chat with you about are uh, 
and get some background on is like one of them was, I that caught me right off was Code of Life. What was what where was the inspiration for that one? Yeah, the, the Code of Life that is uh, uh, written by Kuhn, the keyboard player, uh -huh. and he uh, he he was inspired by uh, uh, Arabic scales, and the we did we did some touring with Mira, is a band from yeah. Tunisia, uh -huh. and uh, they I think he got some some inspiration for, uh, from touring with them because they they have uh, a lot of songs in, into this direction. And that's also why we asked uh, the singer uh, from Mira to rejoin us uh, on this track, just from the, for the for the atmospherical focus at the beginning and the uh -huh. end. But uh, it's uh, it makes a huge di difference to have him on the track because it really makes the circle full. Yes, and uh, and for yeah, for the first time in a long time, we have uh, two uh, uh, Arabian Oriental tracks. So this and one of them is the Code of Life. Yeah. And and then the other one that I enjoy was the Abyss of Time. Um, ah, yeah. And that what, tell me a little bit about that song. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny story because uh, with with another project, uh, United Metal Minds, uh -huh. uh, I got I got to learn a guy in France. Uh, his name is Jerome Bailey, and uh, I worked so nicely together with him on uh, on some songs for United Metal Minds that I, that I asked him. Shall we also write together uh, an Epica song? Because I always, uh, for some some uh, songs, I like to work with with uh, some somebody new that gives me uh, some inspiration that I I wouldn't have gotten if I work on myself or work with the people that I know already. Uh, so I worked with him on the Abyss of Time, and uh, that's that's typically a song that I would have never happened to occur if I wouldn't have worked with him on it because ah. uh, he. He had some really refreshing ideas, and uh, so I, I, together with him, I wrote a song. Then I, I uh, uh, brought it to to the band, and then together we uh, changed many parts again, and then it became the final uh, song as it as it is now. But the, but often it's very important the basis when you uh, the first ideas that is uh, very nice if you get challenged by somebody to get you out of your comfort zone. And yes. that's, what, that's what happened with this song. So so being that it wasn't your comfort zone, it brought out new things that you wouldn't have ever even thought about then is, is kind of what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I would have never written on my own a track like this. But it's, it, it, it is typical a track that I would want to write. <laughs> so yeah. that's the, the, the funny contradiction. And sometimes you need an, an, an external... Uh, uh, factor, which is uh, Jerome in this case, uh, to to yeah to trigger and challenge you, and also come up with great ideas like he did. So going back to Code of Life, you know, working with the Merith guys, did that did that same kind of a thing happen with the with using them as in the recording? Uh, no, with uh, with this was a kind of a different story because okay. uh, Kuhn wrote the whole song by himself. Okay. And and then he brought it to the band, and then like like we do with all songs, we we we, we write it till we feel like we cannot do any further, uh -huh. and then we we work on on it as as the band as a whole. So we work on each other's tracks a lot, and and that's what makes the the songs always eventually much better than we could have done that by ourselves. That's why it's so important to have that that period of time where we work on each other's tracks as a, as a, as a band. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, and that's, so he, he wrote the whole song by himself and then together we, we finished it. Nice. And then the last one I wanted to, to mention was, uh, the synergize that's a, that song. Oh man, that's a great song. Yeah. Yeah. It's also one of my favorites. And, uh, that's a Isaac song. So it's funny that you mentioned from, from every writer, like one song. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's a good sign because that uh, that shows that uh, that how how uh, yeah how uh, happy we can be that we have so many good songwriters in, in one band. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah, he came up with that track, and uh, right away we felt like oh, this is going to be an album track. Uh, so it uh, it's the same like what what uh, what happened with the Kuhn song. Isaac worked on like the the, the the track by himself, and then brought it to to the band. 
Okay. And we finished it together. Oh, okay. So I know all the tracks on the album are probably somewhat your baby and you're really proud of all of them, but are there any that stand out to you that more than others for one reason or another? Um, for me, it's personally, it's the kingdom of heaven, uh, part three, one that, uh, is my personal favorite. And that's the, the reason for that is, uh, first of all, because it, uh, it, it contains all the epica elements, it goes from half, little soft from dark to light yeah choirs simona grunts everything is in that song and uh, also the because it's special to me uh, because i wrote the song together with uh, isaac uh, 50 50 mm-hmm. and uh, both both of our grandmothers passed away in the same week uh. during that we were writing the song but the, the beautiful thing is that we could dedicate the song to both our grandmothers so that made it a uh, uh, yeah, extra special uh, to to both of us. Very nice. So, the uh, are there any tracks that, when we finally are able to get back out and see live shows, that you're looking forward to playing live? Yeah, this time it's quite a bunch of, of tracks that I'm looking forward to play live because we also, when we were writing the songs, we were already with many of those songs, keeping in mind to play them on a, on a big festival, for example. So. Yeah. They were written with, with that thought in mind. And yeah, then I really look forward to Abyss of Time, to play that one live. Yeah. Uh, the, the the Kingdom of Heaven Part 3, mm-hmm. I look, look really forward. Omega, the title track. Yeah. Um, also, Seal of Solomon. Oh, okay. uh, that's also one of the songs I look really much. Yeah, there's quite some songs I look forward to. It's it's hard to choose actually. Yes. Yeah. So it's uh, so it sounds like when you guys get when we get, finally get live shows back that that this is going to be a really good Omega is going to be a good representation of what um, the, a live show is going to be like. Yeah, there's going to be quite some Omega songs. Yeah. Unless the the fans uh, say like, oh, we 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 want a lot of uh, old songs, uh, yeah. but. Uh, I, I am, I'm pretty convinced that people can enjoy uh, a bunch of these tracks live. Yes, yes. Well, so when was the last time you guys actually played live? Uh, that was the February, I think, of uh, 2020. Okay. Wow, so we're coming up on a year. Yes, yeah. yes. It's already <laughs> almost a year. Yeah. <laughs> So what, what about your other projects like Mayan and stuff? Have you been working with that at all? Yeah, Mayan is uh, it's a bit difficult because we, with, with that band, we really write by seeing each other. So sitting in one room ah, and writing okay. the stuff. And as we are living very far away from each other, it's, and then all the time these uh, travel restrictions, it, it didn't uh, came to, to, to be yet. Uh, but... Hopefully, hopefully uh, things will get better soon, and then uh, we can also start making some new Mayan plans uh, again. Because yeah. we also had some some nice shows coming up, like our 10 year anniversary, mm-hmm. and we had to also postpone postpone that. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a, it's a rough time, but uh, eventually things will will get better. So I, I was going to ask you too. Um, we lost a couple of great guitar players, Alexi and uh, Eddie Van Halen, this last in this last few months. Yeah, I'm curious as to how each one of those guys influenced you and what they meant to you. Yeah, and the, the funny thing is because most guitarists say Eddie Van Halen is for them is uh, the the number one of the two. Yeah, but for me, Alexi Alexi was by far the biggest inspiration of the two. Huh. Okay. So uh, I I was already going to to their early shows uh, after their first album, and uh, I was blown away by by that band, and uh, I kept following them. And I I'm pretty sure these, that that Children of Bottom is one of the bands that uh, would that has inspired a lot after Forever. So mm-hmm. after Forever wouldn't have sounded the way it, it did without Children Children of Bottom, mm-hmm. and from after Forever came Epica. So. Uh, for me, uh, yeah, Alexi was a big inspiration. Nice, and and Eddie Van Halen. I'm sure that do you do you rem- you listened to him and heard some of his stuff. I mean, he he might not have directly influenced yeah. you, but he influenced the people that influenced you, right? 
yeah, also I mean, he himself influenced me for, for sure because yeah, yeah uh, every guitar player gets influenced by by Eddie in a way. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there's so so many uh, great songs for, from Van Halen. So it's uh, yeah, it's, but but uh, but not particularly. Uh, he was, for example like a big idol to me yeah but, uh, yeah it was more like slash uh, from guns and rose that was like when i was a teenager really like a big idol to me and uh, eddie van Halen was uh, uh, amazing guitar player but not particularly somebody i was uh yeah having posters above my bed from yeah yeah but it, it like alexi more influenced your style yeah yeah yeah, yeah definitely so over the last year i've got to ask what other than music stuff, what have, what have you been doing? I mean, have, have you been binging any series on Netflix or movies or anything? Or yeah, I hear from all these people they're Netflixing all day long, and I, I think like, come on, uh, get, get yourself another hobby. <laughs> 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 to me, it feels like uh, oh, what a waste of time. And I, I watch Netflix myself too, but but just uh, the, like like one hour before I go to sleep. Ah, okay. Not. I really cannot imagine from one from the morning till the evening only watching Netflix. That's that's really not for me. But uh, everybody has to do what they like, of course. <laughs> but, yeah. But I, I I have so many other things that I like, like like riding my bike. I did a lot of uh, work in the garden that uh, at, at my house. That I still think many things have to be done, and still many things have to be done. So this this year off uh, was not that bad for me because I was just living one year in my new house and, and so many things were unfinished that I still get headaches when I think back of, of, of all these things that had to be done. But now finally we start having a, a house that is pretty much livable. Nice, <laughs> nice. And I know, I know you're, you're, you're a big psychology guy and you that is, I'm just curious as like, some of the shows, like, like, like for instance, the big show of 2020 over here was like, the Tiger King, you know, and, and from a psychology standpoint, I mean, I don't know if you watched it at all, but I'm just curious as to your take on somebody like that. I even don't know what the Tiger King is. Oh, you've never even heard of the Tiger King. It was the guy, oh. the, uh, his name was Joe Exotic, and he, had, he ran a uh, kind of like a zoo, but not really a zoo in Oklahoma in the United States, and he, he raised tigers from babies, and he was, he was kind of an odd fellow. And, you know, it was, just, it was one of those things that you just it – it took over over here, and it was like the thing for, for lockdown over here, so – Okay, yeah, yeah, it, it didn't make it uh, to to all the places of yeah, Europe, I guess. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but uh, I'm a I'm an animal lover myself. I have uh, three dogs and six cats. Nice. And uh, uh, I, I, wherever I can, I, I try to help uh, animals. I also uh, sometimes visit child shelters and uh, bring them food because here's a big problem with uh, stray dogs uh, yeah. in the streets. And there's there's many of them, and. Uh, uh, yeah, wherever I can, I try, I try to help, and uh, also it's really nice to see that uh, that other people doing so many great things for the for these animals. That um, yeah, it's it's really a, a big problem, but but really it makes you also feel happy when you can help a few of them. Yes, yes, and it's it's funny you mentioned dogs and cats because I. I, I train, I've trained dogs for over 20 years and I, it's oh. from a psychology standpoint, I find it very interesting how people don't understand dogs or cats and they try to treat them like humans. Yeah. No, I never understand that either. <laughs> and also put them clothes on. And yeah, stuff and yeah, I, yeah. I never get that. Yeah. I get it when it's very cold in certain, certain, certain regions yeah. and to put that dog, a kind of a dog jacket that I completely understand, but, but not dressing them like humans uh, right. or, or treating them like humans. Dogs are dogs and dogs have dog qualities and cats are cats and have that cat exactly. qualities. In it. Dogs and cats are already very different and let alone humans and dogs and humans yeah. and cats. Yeah. I, I, I always have like this conversation with people and I tell them, I say, you and I are talking. Do you think your dog understands when you're talking to it? You're just diminishing your, your voice by having this conversation with your dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. My, my, actually, my girlfriend is, is talking a lot to the cats. Oh, is but, she? Uh, okay. But, but uh, and at first I thought it was very funny and, uh, 
but uh, actually she she talks with a certain frequency ah, that, okay. the cats, uh, that the cats that the cats come when when she's when she's on the balcony and she she calls them they are really coming nice nice <laughs> and I, I always thought that the cats don't listen to to when you call them but but she found a way that they good do. for her good for her <laughs> yeah so I was going to ask you too what do you think I mean with everything that's gone on in the music industry this year. Has, do you think that for, it's forever been changed, or do you think we'll get back to some semblance of normal eventually? Yeah, it's a, that's a tough question because uh, uh, the longer it takes, the more I start doubting if, if we ever get uh, these big festivals again. Because yeah, um, yeah it, it seems that, uh, that that this is going to take a long time, and uh, there. The people in charge, they're also talking in a bit in a way that, that, that discomfort me a bit, that like that we will never go completely back to the old normal, but we have to adapt to the new situation. Mm-hmm. And then I think like what what things are going to be like it used to be or what things are going to change forever. And I hope that festivals are not one of these things that are, are never going to happen again. That would make me very sad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but what about like, what do you think about like, like mosh pits and stuff like that? I mean, do you think we've, we've altered that so much because of our fear of, of what's out there? Yeah, it's, that's also hard to tell. I, I think uh, as soon as there are festivals, pretty much soon after there will be also mosh pits again, but it also depends on on the rules and regulations at oh, yeah. that time. Yeah. For example, they let people in in, in small groups of, of, of people and, and in and separate uh, sections. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. Then then mosh pits are are per se because then it, it simply cannot cannot be done anymore. Yeah. But uh, that's that's uh, yeah. It's like uh, predicting the future. It's very hard to tell. Because I, th- I think for me, one of my memories of, of, of an Epica show is, is going to the show and, you know, the, you guys dividing the crowd in half and, you know, and then all of a sudden everybody comes together and it, it, it's, it's, it's just a fun, fun atmosphere. And yeah. I think, is that changed? I really hope not. Yeah, I really hope not as well. And uh, if you ask me personally, I... I I see uh, festivals returning and 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 uh, yeah, experiencing a show the way it was. Yeah. But it, it depends all on on people that make rules. And yep. if they, for whatever reason, uh, say it, it's never allowed anymore, yeah, what what can we do? Exactly. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's hard to tell. But yeah. but personally, I really hope that uh, we we can experience this uh, show. Uh, the way it was before. I'm with you on that one. So cool. my, my last question for you is, I'd like, I've been asking this question for almost a year now. Um, tell me a song by Epica, by title or by content, that best describes the state of the world today. Oh, the state of the world. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, let's see. The obsessive devotion. Okay, that's a that was that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, because because I think I, I think I, I see I see many things happening in the world today, and partly are good initiatives of people that really want things, to, really want to help each other, mm-hmm. and uh, that's a devotion. I think a, a good devotion. Mm-hmm. But you also have have you have kind of obsessive things going on like. Uh, you know, obsessive washing the hands uh, too much that, that that people destroy their hands. That, that uh, I think that cannot be that cannot be good as well. Yeah. So I, I always think like keeping the balance is a good thing. Searching for the middle way, and um, uh, that's I think a key thing to do for the upcoming time. To, yeah. Because otherwise, different groups are I see them r- radicalizing mm-hmm. and drifting away from each other. And I think then that's that never a good, that's never a good thing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, Mark, I appreciate the chat, and everybody get out and pick up Omega on uh, February twenty sixth. And I look forward to ho- hopefully in the near future seeing you guys on tour again. So I hope so, and I and I hope you're right that everybody's going to pick pick up the album. That would mean that we we are. Selling a hell out of albums. Yes, yes, and it, what it means is, is like I was saying that the I feel like the Roaring Twenties are back. 
you know, yeah, that's, yeah, let's let's hope so uh, because I, I I personally also see when you look at the history, every every period of chaos is 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 hard and and, and has some some really terrible moments, but then after, but there comes always a, a beautiful period of, of flourishing and and happiness and. I, I cannot wait for already for that beautiful period of happiness. Uh, exactly. Happiness going to happen in your future. And imagine what it's going to be like that first time you get back on stage after this long. I mean, you, you just picture that in yeah. your head. I mean, that's going to be a glorious moment. So. Yeah, and, and, and that I think that you're going to create more joy rather than if you would uh, play for uh, like 360 sh shows a year. Exactly. And then and then you, you slowly... Yeah, I think uh, the, the the joy diminishes a little bit if you play too many shows. But when you, after a long time of playing no shows, play a show again, I think then the, the joy outburst is is huge. Exactly, exactly. So, well, I appreciate your time again, Mark, and uh, it's been great to Thank talk you to much. you. And uh, I love the new album, and everybody go pick it up, and we'll talk to you soon. <laughs>